so the, the sort of um, research that Chris was talking about um, is very much the topic of my PhD. Um, I came to Australia uh, to do this research on dingoes. And one of the difficulties I had was finding somewhere in Australia where I could study dingoes that are not being poisoned and shot. Um, and I managed to find, um, I, I did research all across the country, and eventually I came across these landowners um, on a station called Evelyn Downs, which is in northern South Australia, so inland Australia. And they said that they don't want to kill dingoes, and generally would rather not kill wildlife, um, and would want to uh, promote an ethical uh, framework for their uh, uh, land. So uh, we started doing some research there as we do elsewhere, but it was quite uh, quick to find out that these, uh, the owners of the station, um, although they had these wonderful intentions, were not actually living on the property, and the people that did live on the property and work on the property were still killing dingoes, and so the problems persisted until the manager left and there was an opening for a job. Um, and my partner and I decided that, you know, okay, how about we take the job, or that is my partner took the job, I was, my job was being the farmer's wife, and we would manage this cattle station and essentially be the guard dogs of the dogs. And uh, during the two years that we were managing the station, at the end of two years we eventually did have a belly full of managing a large cattle station, but during those two years, uh, one of the things that I was able to see firsthand was, A, I was able to see dingoes killing our precious calves, um, and to experience the agony of that, but also to experience the large range of problems that we encounter, that a farmer or a pastoralist that is will encounter in these extremely arid um, environments. Uh, Evelyn Downs, um, it was actually called a baby station, and it was 2,300 square kilometers. So it's 80 kilometers north to south, 30 kilometers east to west. You could not drive it in a day. And the stresses of that environment on the animals, and therefore on the custodians of these animals, was very, very high. One of the reasons why eventually we decided to go back east. Um, so within this environment where we're, we're sending out these cows that are um, Hereford cattle, not exactly a desert adapted um, animal, and expect them to survive and prosper, and to a large extent, it, they certainly, I certainly learned a great, great respect for cattle when I was living out there. Their wisdom and their kindness and, and their personalities, it's incredible. But to imagine for a moment that the big problem for cattle on these stations is dingoes. N no way. The biggest problems for cattle on Evelyn Downs were boggy downs, by far. So during those two years, we recorded every cattle death that we came across opportunistically during the daily routine of man managing the station, and we recorded what were the causes of death. Now, interestingly, most of our calf predations occurred during the first six months of our transition to what is called predator-friendly management. That is when we became the guard dogs of the dingoes. During the entire two years, we lost eight calves to two dingoes that we know of. Eight calves to a herd, within a herd size of 1,400 cattle. We recorded 56, a total of 56 deaths. Eight of them were these dead calves to dingoes. But the others, which included um, prime breeding cows and bulls that are extremely valuable, they were killed by husbandry problems, such as boggy dams. Now the reason why dams get boggy, do, uh, dams are, are, uh, are built um, in, uh, around uh, um, creek, creek lines, and with time they get filled up with silt. As the environment gets harsher, and the water dries up, the cattle have to try and reach the water, and the silt becomes a, a boggy mess. And I cannot tell you about the horrid, sleepless nights thinking about these particular dams that we knew that even after we moved the cattle off these dams, 
this damn cattle kept coming back to what was for them, for some reason, a very attractive, maybe their home. And they would try to reach the water in desperation, and then they would get stuck like that. In this particular case, and in at least another uh, 12 animals, some of them had to have this uh, happen recurringly, we did manage to rescue them. And sometimes we had to rescue them several times, and sometimes after rescuing them, they were just so heat struck, so dehydrated, um, that there was just no, um, that, that they, they just could not survive. And so this is a sense of the reality of what it means to bring an animal like a cow out into the middle of the desert, sending them loose, and then when things go bad, blaming a little 20 kilogram predator, when really the main problem is that we need to become a lot smarter about our husbandry practices. So, as one example, um, we had to dig these trenches into uh, the dam so that the cows would have stable uh, ground to stand on as they walked to water. These are the sorts of issues, including um, uh, um, the problem of even finding uh, humane, um, thoughtful um, cowboys to help us during the muster that wouldn't abuse the animals when they're being um, mustered and sent to slaughter or being desexed and, and so on. So while I was there, I, uh, I won a, a fellowship to I guess give me a bit of a break from the cattle station and go see other places around the world and how they are handling predators. And one place um, I visited was this, uh, this organization in South Africa called the Landmark Foundation, who is working very closely with livestock producers, uh, many of them are sheep producers, to transition to predator-friendly farming. And they did this really, really good um, uh, study with 11 farms that um, were killing predators. In their case, it was leopards, jackals, and caracal. And, um, and then for two years after they stopped killing them, and each farm chose some non-lethal method of transitioning. Some of them put these strange collars around their sheep um, to stop the, the leopards from biting their necks. Some of them used guardian animals. Some of them used herding techniques. Whatever it is that they did, it didn't seem to matter. They all, on average, gained. On these 11 farms, on average, there was a 70% reduction in losses and a 70% reduction in costs per head. So economically, leaving these predators alone and again focusing on husbandry, focusing on our own animals, moving from looking at the predators and trying to exclude them to dealing with our own issues provided a, a much more economical and more sustainable solution for them. I also visited a farm in uh, Zimbabwe, and it's a different system, um, where they were herding a mixed herd, 500 cattle, sheep, and goats, in a land shared with lions, hyenas, leopards, and a whole, the whole range, the whole gamut of African wildlife. And sometimes I get a little bit annoyed with Australian farmers that are whining about dingoes, a 20 kilogram dog, <laughs> and these guys are handling lions. And how do they do it? They use their brains. They figured out that if they can herd their cattle, walk their cattle during the day, and at night time, you can see they bring them into uh, this enclosure called a corral. This is actually a broader system than just protection from predators. It also had to do with how they're moving their cattle in the environment in order to promote the productivity of that environment. But the important thing is that apart from, I think it was a few months ago, I was told that they did lose a, cat, a cow because a cow escaped from the corral at night time, and by the time the, their um, guardian dogs, little feisty little things, and the herders woke up, the herders sleep next to the cows, um, uh, that cow was dead. But for the most part, their problems with predations were solved. What, and, and these are just three examples out of many. And, the, and it doesn't seem to matter what livestock you're talking about, whether it's sheep or cattle or goats or whatever. It doesn't seem to matter what non-lethal method you're using, and it doesn't seem to matter what predator you're in, uh, you're, you have in the environment, whether it's a dingo or a jackal or a lion. What does seem to matter 
is when we stop persecuting predators, and whether these, and including small predators like foxes, very similar stories coming out now from Scotland, that they are able to restore their social structures, whether these are socially complex animals, such as dingoes and wolves, or whether these are more solitary um, predators, such as um, some solitary cats, leopards, and, coo and cougars, they all exist in, in a social domain. And when we're killing them and disrupting these social structures, we often cause an increase in predation, in predation pressure and more problems. So how are we going to transition from this current paradigm of solving our problems by killing wildlife to a paradigm of coexistence? And I'd like to just provide three um, suggestions. One of the big barriers to transitioning to predator-friendly farming, both here and overseas, is the intense social pressure on farmers to conform with the mainstream, that this is how our daddies, 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 daddies have done things, and this is how we're going to continue to do them. And if you're not doing, if you're not killing predators on your property, therefore you are a breeding ground for predators that are going to come onto my property and kill my livestock. And so one important thing that we're working on now as an initiative is a predator-friendly network, which is to provide a social interaction between farmers that have chosen a predator-friendly um, uh, uh, management system so that A, they even know about each other. Some of them think that, they, that they're inventing the wheel, that they're all alone in the world, and that they're the only ones that think that actually killing dingoes or lions or whatever it is is the only way to do things. And more than that, to also make it more possible for them to be aware that, for the most part, the public support them. The public has an overwhelming movement now towards more ethical um, uh, um, um, animal uh, production systems, whether it's in free-range chickens or whether it's in rangelands. The second thing is that there are economic incentives, although I would put them even also in the social incentive. And these are predator-friendly certifications. They exist around the world. They exist um, in South Africa. They exist in North America, South America. And these are essentially labels, like organic labels, free-range labels. And essentially, they provide potentially some benefits. Actually, if I may, just one moment. Um, I can pass this around. This is a, a, a predator-friendly hat. <laughs> um, from just a farmer outside of Yellowstone National Park. Um, if you can just see, you can just see the label inside, so you can see um, what what a what a label like this looks like. And there, there are various um, economic schemes around this, but I still think one of the important things is is that a farmer can stand up tall and straight and tell their neighbor, "Sorry, I'm predator friendly accredited. I simply cannot kill predators." And then there's a third thing that I'd like to bring up, and that this is a cultural shift. And it seems to matter, I'm learning now, that it seems to matter a lot, that the values that inform our decisions and that are guiding what it is that we're trying to do make a huge difference. It matters if our views are utilitarian, that is, we won't kill predators because we'll make more money, or that we may have a different view, we're not, we won't kill predators because they have an inherent value. They have a certain right to live in the landscape because we don't want to cause harm and suffering to others. And I'd like to give one example of a country that seems to be the very embodiment of a value system that is based on compassion. Or another word for that would be ahimsa, nonviolence and compassion. And that is India. India, with one of the highest human populations in the world still has lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. They do. How the heck do they do that? I came there from Australia. We all know about the massive extinction rate, and yet we have such a low human population density. And India has, they're probably going to surpass China. I think the, the prediction is that by 2028 or something, they're going to be they're going to be the most human populous country in the world. You cannot get away from people in India. How can it be that large, dangerous wildlife are surviving and in some cases thriving? The Asian, um, Asian lion, the only surviving population is in India. The tiger population 
the largest population in the world is in India. So I'd like to give a, couple, a few examples. And I'd like to give them with uh, a couple of stories. And one is the story about this Jain community that I heard about, which I thought was pretty damn cool. Jains make vegans look like cold-hearted bastards. <laughs> and they had a problem because these leopards were killing their goats. And so they went to, and this is what you do, they went to the forestry department, that's the authority, and said, can you please catch this leopard and move this leopard for us because he's killing our goats. Now this is India. They said, yeah, sure. Weeks, months go by and obviously nothing happens. And this leopard continues to kill their goats. So eventually they get fed up and they build a trap and they catch the leopard. And then they go back to the forestry department and they say to them, we've got your leopard. Can you please now take this leopard and move them wherever they need to go? The forestry department said, ha ha, you didn't have a permit to catch a leopard. And so they were stuck. They didn't know what to do. Do they let the leopard out? Do, they, do the forestry department won't take it? So for at least a fair amount of time, they have this leopard stuck in this cage, and they don't know what to do with it. Of course, they will not feed the leopard meat. They are strictly plant-based. They will not kill an animal in order to feed the leopard. But they're worried that the poor leopard is starving. So they decide the community comes together, and they cook up this big meal of rotis, which is a vegetarian Indian cuisine, which certainly is not fit for a leopard. <laughs> they feed this stuff to the leopard, and eventually after I don't know how many days, the official from the forestry department do, does come out, and apparently it is written in his official notebooks that he could not believe his eyes when he saw leopard hungrily eating rotis. <laughs> and I'd like to just another quick example is uh, a, a friend who has been uh, hanging out with this these Dangar herders. Now this, uh, of course, I mean, the, the, it, the, the religion um, differs, and, and the Dangar, I think, are Hindus, um, and, and they have sheep. And, once, and, and the, their sheep herds, they walk with them, they're semi-nomadic, and the wolves follow them as they, as they travel. And occasionally the wolves kill their, um, kill their, their, lives, their, their sheep. That's a, that's a wolf there um, out in the background, and there's another picture of the wolf actually running off the sheep. And when he was there, he saw how this wolf ran off with the sheep, and he asked them what they were going to do about it. And they said, well, she has to eat too. And I'd just like to end with this example that is a lot more simple that I got to see. I, I, was, I was in Bangalore, and, um, and there's this place, and it's got a lot of macaques. And, um, uh, a macaque went into this, this truck driver, uh, truck driver's car, stole the truck driver's keys, and went up a tree. And I was fascinated just by what the truck driver was doing. He just stood there and watched the macaque, and waited patiently until the macaque finished playing with the keys, dropped it on the ground, and he took the keys again. He never for a moment lost his patience, he never got pissed off. He didn't say we need to now control all my cats because they steal keys. He just took it easy because this is a world in which we're not always safe and things do go wrong. And that doesn't mean that the first thing we're going to do is take out a gun. Thank you.